today, as you see there, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Just let me ask, anybody need a good word today? Uh, like, we need that, right? Some of you are like, no, Jesse, we've got our coffee bar back. we got our sugar in us. Uh, the kids are already going away. Like, what more could we need? Uh, but we got some amen on the front row already. But I love Colossians 3. Because when you study this, what you see that we've been through in Colossians 1 through 2. So those chapters that we've covered, those chapters are mainly doctrinal. And so that just means what they've been teaching us is what we need to rightly believe. So what we've been seeing, if you have not been with us, is Paul basically telling us, say, this is who Christ is. Because again, these false teachers, they have come in and they have attacked the supremacy of Christ. So they have tried him out. To make him out to be something less than he is. Try to make him out to be less than fully God. But Paul has been combating this way of thinking the whole time. And how has he been doing that? By pointing us, by teaching us, by growing us in the truth of who Christ actually is. And so again, chapters 1 and 2 are mainly based on knowledge, based on doctrine. I want to be clear, doctrine, what we believe is right, is so important. It's foundational. Like, you have to know the truth before the truth can set you free. But in chapters 3 and 4, so we now move from doctrinal now to practical. So from orthodoxy, which is right knowing, now to orthopraxy, which is right living. Because the truth is, you can know about something all you want. You can be the smartest person in the world when it comes to certain things. But if you're never able to put your vast knowledge into action, so never able to use it for anything practically... It's not really that useful. Like if you can't act on something, there's not much use in knowing that something. It's like the question I always get when I taught algebra. Mr. Bible, Coach Bob, when are we ever going to use this? And you had two options, didn't you? You could lie to them. Oh, you're going to use it every day. I'm sure this past week you all saw for X, didn't you? You all found some points of intersection on parabola this past week, didn't you? So you could lie to them or you could tell them the truth. Like you're never going to use it. Like never, ever. But listen, church. Where we're at in our verses today, especially verses 1 through 4, is a major turning point in the letter. So it goes from what we must know to now how we must use what we know. How do we take what Paul's been saying and now make it practical for us as Christians? So let's just read those first four verses. And God's Word says, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, So, if you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you'll also appear with him in glory. And so let's pray and walk more through the scripture. But as we pray this morning, I want to lift up a certain prayer request. So there's a man in Canada by the name of James Coates. And I don't know if you've heard about this, but the man is a faithful minister of God's word. He's in prison right now for simply opening up his church. So because of COVID restrictions, they said, hey, you can't open church. He said, I'm going to open my church anyway. And now he's separated from his young family. Going to be in prison for three months up until the hearing. And the Bible tells us, Hebrews 13, 3, remember those in prison as if you were in prison with them. Look, we are so blessed here. We don't know what it's going to come to here. We praise God for that. We want to lift him up in prayer. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we come to you through your Son, who sits and reigns on the throne. And in this we find our confidence. We thank you that he is the atoning sacrifice for our sin. God, that we can find redemption through Jesus. God, we come to you as a church family right now, lifting up James Coates and his family. We pray for the leaders that they would come to the knowledge of the truth of who you are and what you're about. God, we just ask that we be mindful of those who are suffering persecution in Canada, in America, around the world. God, help us to be mindful of our brothers and sisters. God, we also come petitioning you that your word would be alive and active this morning. God, I know it's so easy for us to come and sit and be distracted, but raise up your word to pierce our souls. We need it. I need it. 
God, this is different than anything else we approach at any other time. This is your time. Help us to have sincere hearts as we open up your word and study. And we pray this through your son. Amen. So as we dive in, I've got one simple question for you to think about. Like, I do not believe this is going to be a hard question for you to answer. It's a yes or no question. And the question is this. How many of you here this morning like and or love getting new clothes? All right, be honest. I'm not going to judge you for it. This is not a condemning question. I know some of you are like, Jesse, you're going to tell us that's a bad thing, that's sinful, like we should give all our new clothes to the poor. It's nothing like that. It's just like, how many of y'all like getting new clothes? All right, so everybody in the church basically likes getting new clothes. Again, nothing wrong with that. But listen, I've got one more follow-up question to that question. Whether you like getting new clothes or not, how many of you here ever get new clothes but never actually wear them? Anybody fall in that category? So there's some hands going up. I know for some of you that seems like a dumb question, right? It's like who in their right mind would get new clothes not ever actually put them on? But the truth is we know of people like that, and we saw some hands. Some of you all are like that. Like we know there are people who will get a new jacket, a new dress, new pants, new shoes, and just tuck them away in their closet for what seems like forever, right? My oldest sister, Jill, she was like that. She still may be like that. She moved to Greenville, so we had a falling out. We don't really talk much anymore. But look, she would get new clothes, and Mom would get so mad at her all the time because she would just put them in her closet and never wear them. And Mom would ask her, like, why in the world would you get new clothes and not want to actually use them? And Jill said, I just don't want to mess them up. I just don't want to get them dirty. Look, as crazy as that sounds, really what Paul is getting at here now is he's saying what he's going to show us would be just as crazy as getting new clothes and never actually putting them on. Do you see the picture that Paul is painting here in chapter 3? It's got this very idea. It's the idea of being given new clothes, actually probably more accurately. It's like being given a complete makeover. And so Paul wants to make sure that if we've had this makeover, so we've gotten this new wardrobe, that we are not just hanging it up in the closet. No, he wants to make sure, hey, we're taking these clothes, we're actually putting them on, we are wearing them. He's going to show us that as Christ followers, as Christians, we have been given a new self. And what does that mean? That means we actually have to put on the new self. And so it leads us to a question, what do we have to know? What do we have to recognize to be able to put on the new self? So to actually be able to put these new clothes on, well, first we see out of chapter 3, we have to recognize the new self has a new home. As you study this book, what you see throughout it is Paul's argument kind of like a seesaw. So you've got him teeter-tottering between Christian identity, so who we are because of what Christ has done, and then Christian lifestyle. So how we should live now in light of what Christ has done. That's why he starts in, in verse 1, where he says, So, if you have been raised with Christ... There's the identity as one who has been raised with Christ. But what does that mean? It means that just as Jesus was put to death, but then resurrected from death, just as he was taken from death to life through the power of God, if we here this morning have repented of our sin and confessed Jesus as Lord over our life, we too have been taken from death to life. Romans 6, 4 says, We were buried with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk, not in our old way, but might walk in newness of life. We too might be raised. And so there's the identity. And like I said, that new identity must lead in your life to a new lifestyle. So if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And listen, why would we ever do this? Why would we seek after things above? Simply put, because that's where our new home actually is. You see, in Christ, the new self has a new home. And the reality is when you got a new home, when you have a better home, you're not concerned. You ain't worried about the old home. So have you ever gotten a new home before? I doubt that you've been worried about making sure that your old home stays clean, right? It's like, Jesse, we don't worry about making sure our new home stays clean. But don't ruin the point here, okay? Look, how many of you, if you've got that new home, making sure that old home has the best landscaping, 
We don't do that, do we? How many of us with that new home make sure that old home has all its appliances working? No, we don't seek after those things. Why? Because those things don't matter anymore. Because you see, a new home, a new residence, it changes things. It changes where our affections, our pursuits, even our hope is going to be. And listen, if we have been raised with Christ, if you've been raised with Christ, where is our new home even currently? Even in this moment, it's wherever Christ is. Our home is currently, I know this is a weird concept, our home is currently right now in this moment in the heavenlies. We, in a sense, have already been raised and seated where Christ is. As you see in verse 3, for you died. Those in Christ, you died a spiritual death. And your life is hidden with Christ and God. Our home now is safe, it's secure. When Christ, who is now not some of your life, not an add-on to your life, but when Christ, who is now your life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. Then we'll finally arrive. Then the new self will finally be ushered into our new home. It's like the story told about the famous Archbishop John Chrysostom. There was a time that he was taken before the Byzantine Empress Eudoxia. And like many times in Chrysostom's life, people didn't like what he was doing. And she was the same way. She didn't like how he approached God. She didn't like his resistance to her authority. So in common with powerful people of that day, she threatened him. So first she tried to scare him with banishment. But he replied, you cannot banish me. For this world is my father's house. But I will kill you, said the empress. No, you can't. For my life is hidden with Christ and God. I'll take away your treasures. He said, nope. For my treasure's in heaven and my heart is there. Like I can just see if I was Chris, I'm doing nanner nanner boo boo the whole time with this, right? But she says, I'll drive you away from your friends and you'll have no one left. He says, no, you won't. No, you can't. For I have a friend in heaven from whom you cannot separate me. I defy you. There is nothing you can do to harm me. Listen, friends, this is what a new resurrection perspective, a new home perspective on life does. It allows the eternal to impact the temporal. And so that's why I tell you, so the new self has a new home. And that new home actually really leads to, as we see secondly this morning, the new self has a new aim. I just want to ask you this morning, how many of you here are goal-oriented people? How many of you like to set goals for yourself? Well, obviously you like to define your success so you know if you're successful, right? But then on the flip side, how many of you are like me and you don't like to set goals? Like we don't like to set goals because we know probably we're not going to reach those goals, right? Like I can set a goal for eating better, but I know I'm not going to eat better, so why do it, right? Like I can feel like a chubber, that's one thing, but I feel like a chubber and a disappointment and a failure, that's a lot emotionally to take in for ourselves. But listen, whether you like to set goals or not, there is a goal we must set. There is an aim that you and I must have in our Christian lives. It's written in verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And look, what a simple verse, right? There's nobody here this morning reading this verse. I mean, like, I just don't understand what Paul is saying here. But as simple as it is to understand, what a tough verse to put into practice. Would you not agree? Like to set our minds on things above. Because let me tell you what is true in our lives. Our minds are a battlefield. Churches, there are so many things competing for our minds' attention. Like I know that we can hear we're supposed to set our minds. So we're supposed to consistently be thinking about heavenly things and holy things and Christly things. But while I can tell you that, while you can hear that all day long, that does not mean that's what we do. Let's be honest, church. You see, I think one of the biggest opponents to Christians maturing in Christ, so one of the biggest opponents to our sanctification is that we kind of have this verse reversed in application. Because what we have, we have our mind not set on heavenly things, not on high things. No, we got our mind set on earthly things. Look, I think one of the biggest hindrances to our sanctification is we don't put this verse into practice. Let me try to paint what Paul is saying here like this. So imagine you're moving to China. 
So for whatever reason, you and your family are about to pack up and move overseas. But if you're moving to China, let me ask you, what might you do? What should you do before you make that move? What you should do, you should set your mind towards the things of China, right? So you probably want to start thinking about, how can I adapt to their culture? You want to start thinking about, hey, what am I going to do there? How am I going to survive there? How am I going to make a living there? You probably want to set your mind to learning Chinese. You probably want to set your mind to learning how to use chopsticks. Maybe learn some karate. Maybe learn how to digest cat. I don't know what it is exactly you'd have to do. But this is where your mind needs to go. You mean, this is where your new aim needs to be. And church, in the same way, hear me, understand, we are moving somewhere else soon. Like we said, the new self has a new home. And the new self and the new home should lead to a new aim. And you see, the problem for you today, the problem for me today, is not that we don't have an aim. No, the problem is, and we know it, we're aimed way too low, aren't we? The problem is, what we're aimed at right now is how can we be successful in this world? Is that not what we think about? That's what I think about. What we aim at is how can we be locked in this world? How can we be happy in this world? This is what our minds tend to gravitate towards. But brother, sister, hear me. I'm not saying those aims are simple, but I'm saying those aims are way too low. It's like Les Brown said, most people fail in life not because they aim too high and miss, because they aim too low and hit. But let's not be like most people, especially when it comes to the things of God. Our aim, our focus needs to be firmly set on the things above. I mean, just like a compass points north, our disposition should point itself. Our life should be drawn towards the things of heaven. Listen, because our minds are a battleground. This is not something that happens overnight. This is not an easy thing. I mean, even this week, Lauren and I were having a really hard conversation. Look, this wasn't a fight. This wasn't an argument. I'm sure that we had some of those this week. I've probably just blacked that out from my memory. But we were talking this week about our lives. Like, we were just talking about, what are we really doing? You ever have that moment, these feelings, like, what are we even doing? You're like, what's the point? We feel that right. But we were having that conversation, like, what are we really doing? Like, yeah, we want to do this, we want to do that. But is our aim in these things really, when you get it down to brass tacks, to please ourselves or to please Christ? Are these things we're doing, we're hoping to do, done with a heavenly mindset or with an earthly mindset? Look, kind of where we landed, it's a little bit of both. I think our conclusion was basically, yeah, we have our minds set above on some things, but not on all things. Like we just said, this world is weighing us down. Like the pull and draw of the world is lowering our aim. And we decided we just want to day by day start lessening the distractions from the world. We want to start shifting our focus from what's below to what's above. And we ask you, would you pray for us in that? We want to pray for you in that. Would you pray for us? Like, help us to get our aim where it needs to be. But I ask you the same thing. Could it be? If you were to be truthful, you can't get your mind set on things above because you're too full of what's below. Could it be in your life right now if you think about your priorities, your ambitions? You're aiming way too low. Like C.S. Lewis famously said, aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. But do what the majority of people do, aim at earth and you ain't going to get either. And if C.S. Lewis doesn't do it for you, I hope God's word does because Romans 8, 5 says, for those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. He goes on to say, but those who live according to the flesh, they're going to die. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on things of the Spirit. And those people, those will be the ones who actually live. And so I tell you this morning, the new self has a new home. That new home leads to a new aim. And thirdly, we see the new self has also a new mission. And so if we go back to the idea of getting some new clothes, let me ask you, how many of you get new clothes and you put them on over the top of your old clothes? Anybody do that? You wouldn't do that, would you? Like, how many of you get a new pair of underwear and you're like, okay, I've got this old pair here, but I just don't feel like taking them off. I'm just going to put on the new pair over the old pair. 
Nobody raise your hand that you do that, even if you do do that. We don't want to know that. Look, that's ignorant. Doesn't make any sense. That's nasty, right? No, before we put on the new clothes, what do we do? We have to take off the old clothes. See, in the early church, when a believer was getting baptized, what would happen is right before they were immersed in the water. So representing dying and rising with Christ. And look, if you're here this morning and you've not been baptized, you've not taken that next step of, that next step of faith, I should say, and went into the water. Let me encourage you. This is a really, really important picture. What would happen right before they went into the water? They would take off their outer layer of clothes. And then when they came up out of the water, he or she would then put on new, clean clothes, representing what they had now become in Christ. So this is really the idea that Paul is getting at here. He's saying, okay, so now your new outfit has arrived. So the new self is here, not because you earned it, not because you deserved it, but solely because of the grace of God demonstrated through Christ. Because unbeliever, hear me, because what God has done, he has sent his son to take your punishments, to take your place on the cross and make us clean. And so if you're here and you've not accepted Christ as Savior, please don't leave today without talking to one of us. But Paul says, because the new is here, here's what you have to do. You must get rid of the old. So you have to take off the old clothes so you can put on the new. Let's read in verse 5. Therefore, so because you've been raised with Christ, because Christ is now your life, put to death. Put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, or covetousness, which is idolatry. And look, we don't have nearly the time to do justice to this vice list that Paul gives us here. And understand, this is not a comprehensive list. What most scholars believe, and I believe it as well, that in this list in particular, so all these five things, they essentially tie into the first thing. So they all tie in. They all have to do with being sexually immoral, sexually impure. I mean, even when it comes to being greedy, thinking here is that it's talking about being greedy, it's coveting in the sense of wanting more and more and more sexual gratification. Look, is that not a pretty good summary of our culture today? We have a culture that just wants more and more and more sexual gratification. Like if you've got ears and eyes at work, you know we are plagued by sexual immorality. Listen, sexual immorality is nothing new. No, this has been around since the beginning of time. Like if you want to have some uncomfortable moments with your kids, go read Genesis, right? Go read about Noah and his daughters. Go read about Ona and Tamar. Should make for some good dinner conversation if you're interested in that sort of thing. Look, what does it mean to be sexually immoral? I would summarize it like this. Sexual immorality is essentially the selling off or the giving up of our sexual purity. Sexual immorality is any type of sexual expression, any type of sexual act outside of the boundaries of a biblically defined marriage relationship, not between one man and another man, not between one woman and another woman, but between one man and one woman. And understand to adopt a Christian view of sexuality was radical in Paul's day. And hear me, it's still radical today. If you adopt what the Bible really teaches on sexuality, you're going to be labeled as a bigot. You're going to be labeled as narrow-minded and probably even worse. But the truth, church, is the truth. And the truth is if we are engaging in any kind of physical intimate pleasure, I don't care if it's in person I don't care if it's online. I don't care if it's just in our minds, outside the one man or the one woman in which we are married, outside of our own sister. And as we talk about in Proverbs 5, we are in sin. Plain and simple. We are then living as the old self. The Bible is very clear. Because of these, because of this way of living, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedience. Then I love how Paul transitions. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. Paul says, and this was us pre-Christ. You see, pre-Christ, we had no conviction. We didn't really have that big an issue with being sexually immoral, with being evil, with being greedy. But now he says, that is not us anymore. Look, I want to be very careful here. I'm not saying that we won't slip up. 
I'm not saying that the new us will be incapable of falling into error, of giving into sexual immorality. But I am saying that although it's impossible to have been raised with Christ, to be new and continually, habitually, consistently live like the old. I think the Bible teaches that if you're here and you're living in sexual immorality, sexual sin, or actually any kind of sin for that matter, and you have zero conviction, you have zero conviction ever from the Holy Spirit, saying, hey, this is wrong, this is not who you are anymore, you need to stop it, you need to repent of it, then you can say what you want. But the truth is, the great likelihood is you're still dead in your sin, and God's wrath is still coming for you. Look, I know this is hard. But God's word is hard sometimes. This is what we see right here. And I know I'm harping on this, but hear me. Lord and I deal with this all the time, and we hate it. It's awful. But there's no doubt in our minds that sexual immorality among professing Christians is doing probably more damage in the church today than anything else. Like, here's what we know. That sexual sin is so deceptively destructive, it destroys. It destroys marriages, it destroys families. Now, can there be sexual sin? Can there be unfaithfulness and God still restore it? Can he put back together the broken pieces? Absolutely. I would even tell you, he longs to restore broken relationships. Even though we might be unfaithful, he is faithful. So if you're here and you're dealing with unfaithfulness in your marriage, in your relationship, God wants to restore it. He wants to bring it back and make it whole. But although God can restore it, sexual sin is so deceptively destructive that it must be definitively killed. Listen, as crazy as this sounds, this is what Paul is saying. He's saying the new self has a license. They've been given a license to kill. He says, we are not to coddle sexual immorality, and we do. We are not to play with lust, and we do. He says, no, we're to kill it. John Owen, I probably said this quote a hundred times, but it's so pertinent. Be killing sin, or rest assured, sin will be killing you. Listen, brother and sister, when it comes to sexual immorality, have zero tolerance for it. I tell you, man and woman alike, don't ever click it. Man and woman alike, don't ever text it. Man and woman, don't ever think it. Man and woman, don't ever do it. 1 Corinthians 6, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And I love this, you are not your own is what the scripture tells you. If you are in Christ, you've been raised, you are not your own. No, you've been bought for a price. So glorify God in your body. Then he goes on to say, he adds to the list, but now put away all the following. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. It looked just like Paul's first set of vices seemed to at the very least tie into sexual sin. All of these here, when you study it, they all seem to tie into Speechful sin. And let me just say this. Sexual sin is no more sinful than speechful sin. But one of the primary ways a person can show that Christ has truly changed them is in how they talk. It's in their speech. Now, I just present it to you. For you to think about what does your speech say about you? Say on your day-to-day conversation, not how you church, not how you talk at church, I should say, but how do you talk outside of church? Is your speech full of anger, full of slander, full of filth? Is it full of inappropriateness? That's a huge problem in our society today. It's a huge problem in churches today. But Paul says, hey, put that away from you. Get that out of your mouth. He says, now that you're new, be careful with what you say. Be careful how you say it and who you say it about. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Look, I could spend a long time here. But I just want to give you one rule to think about before you speak or even before you post because I think it's important for us as representations of Christ as being new. 
That's what you think before you speak or post. Think, first of all, is it truthful? Think, is it helpful? Think, is it inappropriate? Think, is what I'm about to say. Is what I'm about to post needed? And then fifthly, think, is what I'm about to say or what I'm about to post kind? Some of you are like, well, Jesse, I'll never be able to speak again. Like, I'll just have to become a mom or something, I guess, the rest of my life. But brother, sister, we must put this into practice. Because I truly think, if we think before we speak, it'll help us put away a lot of our sinful speech. It's going to help us put on the new self. Let's read in verse 9. Do not lie to one another. Since you've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, you are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your Creator. And like I said, this taking off the old and putting on the new is not a quick process. So this is not like those quick change people that you see when America's got talent or at the circus. Those people are impressive. It's crazy, right? How do they change so fast? It doesn't make any sense in my mind. But Paul says to put off the old self. What's going to have to happen? It takes a lifetime. Hear this, it takes a lifetime of renewal in the knowledge of Christ. And so look, I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight, but here's a challenge for you. Here's a challenge for me today. Day by day, abandon your old ways and start adopting new ways. That's the challenge today. Abandon your old ways, adopt new God-glorifying ways. You think, but Jesse, I can't do this. The sexual sin is so powerful. I just can't seem to control my tongue. But hear me, you do have the power to do this. You have been raised with Christ. This is our new identity. And that new identity gives you the power to live a new lifestyle. Hear me, brother, hear me, sister, hear me, friend. You don't have to be enslaved to sin. You don't. I know you're thinking, I can't help it, I can't get out of it. You don't have to be enslaved to sin if you're in Christ. He has freed you. I tell you, it's not easy. But the best way to kill our desire for sinful pleasure is by setting our minds on eternal pleasure. And look, as the band comes up and we close out this morning, as we think on this idea that the best way to kill our desire for sinful pleasure is by setting our minds on things above, by setting our minds on eternal pleasure. It's like the story told about the guy who used to love sleeping in. I mean, every morning, he would sleep in to like 10 or 11 o'clock. Then all of a sudden, he started getting up at 6 a.m. and going out and jogging. And nobody could figure it out. Like, it was just so strange how this happened all of a sudden. Nobody could figure out why this guy was not sleeping in anymore. But then what they quickly learned was that this guy had a girl that he liked who was also jogging at 6 in the morning. And so it wasn't that this dude didn't find sleeping in pleasurable anymore. No, the truth was he had just found something simply that was more pleasurable now. He had found someone that he desired even more. And look, this is our solution to our sin problem. Whether for you it's sex or your speech, whether it's pride or greed, whether it's idolatry or anything else. The solution to your sin problem is not to remove your desire for pleasure, it's to find your pleasure somewhere else. It's to find your pleasure and my pleasure in Christ. And you see, when we do that, it helps us to be able to put to death all that which opposes Christ. Because as we read in verse 11, in Christ, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free. So there's none of that. But instead, Christ is all and in all. Look, as we close out this morning, as we come to the Lord's table, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, it's a powerful way really to express what we just read here in Colossians 3.11. Because not only is Christ seated above all, but as we see there, He is in all. He's in all Christians, despite our sinful tendencies, despite our shame-filled past. No, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, if Christ has regenerated your heart, then you have died and been buried with Him. You've been raised with Him. And one day, you will appear with Him in glory. This is our new identity. This is our new self. So as we come to the table, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, here's what we got to do. 
We've got to say goodbye to the old things and rejoice in the new things. Rejoice in what Christ has made us. Let us, we in Romans, put on Christ. And don't make any plans to gratify the desires of the flesh. 